Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I actually just got out of Maria Lamardo's talk from the last session. Oh my goodness, it was so good. Uh, I, I am seriously, I seriously can't wait to go to work tomorrow and start putting in some of these reusable widgets that we learned about and basically anything in this conference. Um, well, thank you so much, by the way, for coming to this talk. Um, over quarantine, I had a little of a um, domain purchase that I was really excited about. My puppy, his name is Latte, and I found out that Latte.dog was available. Like it was available, available, no auction or anything like that. And I looked around, I'm like, are you serious? So I purchased it. And uh, so now my dog has a vanity domain name. <laughs> He's not like an actor or anything. He doesn't have a modeling career ahead of him. Uh, so this was just purely for fun for me, but I've been putting a lot of work into it. I got him a little homepage and it's much more than just a landing page. There's a little biography written by me, ghost written by me, and then a little blurb about his parents, myself and my partner, Daniel. And finally, there's also a little bit of photos from this modeling shoot we did when we first got him. So it's a little, it's a little prized possession of mine. Now, I know a lot of folks might be thinking, okay, Kyle, what is the tech stack that Latte.dog's on? <laughs> and I have to say, it's on the, the Jamstack. And the Jamstack is, it's been around for a few years now. So it's fair if you haven't heard of it yet, but also I expect a lot of folks might have heard about it in the blogosphere, on Twitter, uh, or I've probably used it before. And for those of you who might be unfamiliar with it, totally fine. Uh, the J, A, and M in Jamstack stand for JavaScript, APIs, and markup. And the whole idea about the Jamstack is chances are you're probably using at least one of those tools. You're probably using JavaScript, an API, or some markup. But I like to think of Jamstack in terms more of static and dynamic sites. I, I like to think of a Jamstack site as being a static site, but a static site that's created dynamically. And so to talk a little bit more about what this means, what does it mean that to be a static site that's created dynamically, I want to dive into these different definitions of dynamic and static. And a dynamic site from like a, from a big third, like uh, a big overview, a generalization of what a dynamic site is, is when I request, make a request to an app server. It's one of those websites that are so awesome about the, the 21st century where the app server will do a lot for you on the fly. It will make calls to APIs. It can make calls to databases. Uh, it might even make a call to a content management system uh, just to know what text to return to the user. And after it gets all these responses from all of these external data points, it will put together a very customized response and return it to the user. Now, I think this is really cool. Um, it's really personalized. You can give the user a highly flexible response. But not only that, um, it's something that is going to take a little bit more time. There's a little con to that, and that is that there's a little bit more latency. And there's more latency because these requests to content management systems, to databases, to APIs, they're all going to take a little bit of time. They're not instantaneous. Uh, even if you have caching involved. So there's the other side of the coin, static sites. And static sites are really cool because while they're not as dynamic as a dynamic site, when I request something like, let's say the about page, what the static site host will do is say, all right, let me find the static site. Ah, found it. This is me with my, my filing cabinet of HTML pages. And it finds the about.html page and returns it to the user. It's a lot simpler, it's a lot faster. And another cool thing about static sites is a lot of times you can host them serverlessly. Now, what's cool about being serverless is you don't really have to scale up or down your servers depending on an influx of traffic. A lot of times you have the economies of scale working for you. So serverless websites a lot of times are even cheaper. Um, but there is the downside of static sites not being as flexible as a dynamic site. Uh, for example, I can't imagine a static site that's being driven by a content management system. Uh, what would that look like? Well, 
this is where the Jamstack comes in. The Jamstack kind of combines these two, two ideas by bringing in something that we call the build. And the build is gonna look a little bit different depending on what static site generator you use. There's quite a few of them. Uh, there's Next, there's Nuxt, there's Gatsby, there's Eleventy, there is a ton. And there's more coming, it seems like every month. But their main goal, the static site generator's goal is to generate a static site, but they all get there in a slightly different way. However, they all generally take these same steps that I'm about to talk about. The first step in this build is that it collects external data from APIs, content management systems, and databases. So these are the API calls that used to happen on the fly uh, during runtime for dynamic sites. On a Jamstack site, these same API calls are made, but they're pushed to the build. They're, they're made ahead of time before any user even makes a request. Now, what this ends up looking like a lot of times is the Jamstack site crawling the API. So for example, if you give your Jamstack site a WordPress API, the, the Jamstack site during the build will crawl that API. Uh, if it's WordPress, it will grab, grab all the blogs, it will grab all the posts, all the titles, all the authors, all the tags, all the categories, all the, the metadata for your posts. It will grab everything that it can and stuff it locally in your local memory. And it will pass it to uh, your JavaScript app. And it will use some sort of central state management of some sort. A lot of times it's GraphQL. And at this point, you have a massive, massive JavaScript app. And your static site generator is going to take that JavaScript app and chop it up into a bunch of static HTML files, uh, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, et cetera. But it's going to be a static website. So at this point, you're going to have a website that's created using external data or APIs or markup. Um, and at the end of the day, you have a static website that you can upload to some sort of static web host. For example, S3, uh, Netlify is another popular one. A lot of people also use Vercel. You can upload your HTML files to some sort of static site. Now, I really find that cool. And that's what really excites me about the Jamstack. But the Jamstack goes one step further. And it gives us some really neat optimizations. Here's what that looks like. One of the no uh, optimizations that we're going to talk about is the link optimizations, how we navigate through the website. So I want everyone to think for a second. What can we hypothesize if a user who's using a mouse uh, or is uh, using the, the keyboard, what if they hover or uh, activate a link? What can we hypothesize will happen? They might click it. They might want to go to the next link. They might uh, want to click through to that link. And in order to render that next page, usually there's going to be more requests to be made. Uh, maybe the images, the, the CSS, the HTML, the text that needs to be loaded to load that next page. So what the Jamstack does is it says, OK, if the user is hovering over a link, they might click it. So why don't we prefetch pre -fetch these resources that they will need before they click the link so that when they do, we already have those resources. And all we need to do is do a quick little re-render instead of an entire page reload. And here's how that works. So on my screen, I have a video. And it doesn't have any audio. It's just the network tab and latte.dog that's open. And we're going to see here when I hover over these links, the network tab is going to get some requests. These are the prefetched resources. So right now, my cursor is hover over story, over family, and over photos. And each time it hovers over a link, those resources are prefetched. Now, this optimized navigation that is a part of many Jamstack sites is revolutionary. It takes what we know about routing, and it turns it on its head. Uh, when navigating a Jamstack site, we're no longer loading an entirely new page when clicking on a link, but doing a re-render instead. This is awesome for performance and for SEO, but not so much for accessibility. In this talk, we're going to explore a couple of these truly awesome optimizations the Jamstack gives us. 
but we're going to look at them critically with a keen focus on accessibility. We're going to question decisions that have improved important aspects of the web, such as performance, SEO, et cetera, but might have left accessibility behind in the process. Most importantly, though, we're going to explore how to overcome these accessibility issues and how we as developers can fix them without compromising any parts of, of the website. So I want to welcome everyone to accessibility and the Jamstack. I'm Kyle Boss, and I live in Hollywood, California with my puppy Latte, who you already met, and my partner, Daniel. Uh, we met on Tinder, which also happens to be where I work. Uh, we used to have, uh, we have a bunch of Jamstack sites at Tinder, by the way. We have one that is for Swipe Night, which is our in-app, uh, choose your own adventure web series that was inside of Tinder. We had a trailer website that was on the Jamstack. Uh, equally as important, maybe not as exciting, but is the policies page. Our policies page is also on a Jamstack site. And last but not least, probably my favorite project that Tinder has worked on is the interracial couple emoji project. Uh, a few years ago, we found that we couldn't represent interracial love using the hand holding emojis or the kissing emojis or any emoji with two people. Uh, we couldn't represent interracial couples because we had to choose one skin tone. So Tinder decided that they wanted to see this changed. And so we created the interracial couple emoji project and put a petition out. Um, and if you wanna learn more about that project, by the way, you can find it at emoji.tinder.com. Now, a quick shameless plug here. Uh, if throughout this talk, you see a project that you wanna work on, and if you see, um, if you find yourself wanting to work for Tinder, as, as like from a nine to five for a day job, I would love to hear from you. We're always looking for awesome, great people to work on our team and uh, we're always hiring. So please feel free to reach out. My email I'll post at the end. And um, also my DMs are always open. My Twitter handle is at like a Kyle boss and it's posted at the bottom of the slides. Also, oh, this is a good point to mention too. I want to mention that I myself am not an accessibility expert. Uh, nor do I pretend to be. I myself am learning more and more every single day about accessibility and how to make my own websites more accessible because I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important to make this web a beautiful place that's more open and inclusive and accessible to everyone. Um, so I'm giving this talk here today because the more we ensure that new technologies are accessible, hopefully more people join in on this mission to help us make this web an accessible place for everyone. So, where were we? Ah, uh, yeah, accessible navigation. So I mentioned that the Jamstack has amazing optimizations. Uh, a lot of times you'll get link optimizations depending on your static site generator that you will use. But sometimes this might lead to navigation issues when it comes to accessibility. And here's what I mean. Here in this video, you're going to see me go to a link. We're gonna do a link navigation with my voiceover uh, screen reader turned on. I want everyone to observe what happens. Oh no. So we changed links. I clicked on the family link and I was on the homepage and we changed URLs, we changed pages, but there was no announcement. I want to do this one more time. Let's play it one more time and uh, see if you can notice that. That's not good. Um, so folks who are navigating our website uh, who might be cited will be able to see this feedback. They'll be able to see that we've changed pages, right? However, folks who uh, might be visiting our website who have low vision or visual impairments might not get that same exact feedback that the page has changed. Um, a link was clicked, but we're not getting that feedback that we're on a new page. So this is a big issue. Um, assist technologies don't notify the user of a page change, mainly because the browser itself doesn't know that the page has changed. Remember, we're doing a re-render. We're not doing an entire page reload. So the browser isn't going to alert other uh, assist technologies that we're on a new page. So this is a big problem. And how can we fix it? Well, we're going to fix it using something that I like to call a route announcer. And we're gonna be using, I'm gonna be introducing uh, this route announcer React component. And we're gonna go through this code really slowly. We're gonna go attribute by attribute. Um, and 
we're going to code, we're going to pair program together. And um, if, if you're anything like me, when, when I go to a talk and I see a lot of code, I get a little anxious because I feel like I have to understand the code and listen to the presenter. So we're going to go through this attribute by attribute uh, to hope, hopefully make sure that uh, we don't run into this. OK? All right, let's do this. So the first thing that I want to show everyone is the base of the route announcer. Uh, we're going to be using a P tag, a paragraph tag. And inside of that paragraph tag is the page name component uh, prop. And the whole goal here is that whenever the page name changes, we want that page name to be announced to the screen reader or to other assistive technologies. We want the screen reader to announce this page name whenever it changes. And we're going to be doing that via ARIA attributes. And for those of you who might not be familiar with ARIA just yet, they stand for Accessibility Rich Internet Applications. And I like to think of ARIA as a way that we as developers or uh, PMs or designers can let assistive technologies know exactly what certain parts of our website represent. Uh, we're the developers, we're the PMs, we're the designers. We know what this website does. And we want to make sure that we can allow assistive technologies to also be able to know the context of certain things, what certain UI elements represent, um, or certain HTML elements. So that's what we use ARIA for. And we're going to go through a few ARIA attributes to make this route announcer really come to life. So the first one that we're going to use is ARIA Live. And ARIA Live will get us about 90% there for a completed route announcer. And what ARIA Live does is it communicates updates. It'll communicate anything that changes within that HTML element. So alerts, progress bars, timers, um, and we're going to use one of the values that it accepts. There's three values. The first one is off, aria live equals off, and that will turn off updates from the aria live region. And this is usually temporarily, but honestly, our aria live, uh, our route announcer is announcing anything right now, so we probably don't want that one. Now, the next aria live attribute that we can use is aria live polite. And ARIA Live Polite communicates updates, but it does it politely. And here's what I mean by that. Let's add it here into our route announcer. I'm typing into the paragraph tag, ARIA Live equals polite. And when I put that into latte.dog, let's observe what happens really quickly. Family, link list four items, latte's family. Yes, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. So. When I clicked on family, and we got to the family page, and the route announcer announced some things. It announced family, link, list for items, and Latte's family. Um, Latte's family is the route name, the page name that we pass into our route announcer. And I think that is such an awesome thing that it was announced with aria live equals polite. But I do see a couple of things that I would like to change. The first is if you can. Uh, see here, there is Latte's family rendered in the top left-hand corner of our page. We definitely don't want that. Um, we don't want our route announcer rendered. I actually don't have too much of an issue about that, but just in case we do, we want to hide that from, uh, from being rendered. Also, we have family link list for items being announced before Latte's family. And what's actually happening here? It's really subtle. But family link list for items, that's describing the button that was on the previous page that I clicked. And so what the screen reader is doing is it's announcing everything that it was going to announce, and then it tacks on Latte's family at the end. And this might seem subtle now, but if it was reading a paragraph before, it might be a lot of time before it actually reaches our new route. So we want this feedback to be a little bit more immediate. Now, here's how we can do that. There's that third value, aria live equals assertive. And aria live equals assertive will communicate that update, but it'll do it immediately. It will tell the uh, screen reader, hey, stop what you're doing. We need this to be announced right now. So I wanna give that a try and I have a hunch that will fix this issue. So I'm going to change aria live polite in our route announcer to aria live equals assertive. And let's see what happens. So I'm going to click on family and let's observe. Latte's family. 
Yay, that's so exciting. That's exactly what we wanted to happen. We wanted uh, Latte's family to be announced immediately because that page has changed and we don't want to uh, keep giving feedback about the previous page. Now, I mentioned that ARIA Live is, uh, is great for announcing a few things such as timers, progress bars, alerts. It's always helpful to be able to let assistive technologies know uh, exactly what this element represents. For example, we're using a P tag right now, which there's nothing wrong with that. P the P tag is uh, amazing, but we're doing so much more here than uh, just a P tag. The role is going to be slightly different. Uh, is it an alert? Is it a progress bar? Is it a marquee? And to give our screen reader and other assistive technologies this context, we're gonna be using another ARIA attribute called role. And role, its main job is to communicate the UI element that a node represents. And there's quite a few roles for ARIA Live attributes for ARIA Live that I've seen. The first is marquee, uh, and this indicates scrolling text. While marquee has been deprecated in HTML5, there's still times where scrolling text is used. For example, there's stock tickers, there's news tickers, where the, the text scrolls from one side of the page to the other. And that is a perfect opportunity for using role equals marquee. Now, the next role that I wanna talk about is progress bar. This is great for things like loading bars, uh, and you can use other ARIA attributes like ARIA value min, value max, and value now, uh, if you're using progress bar. Also, there's role equals timer for countdowns and clocks. And also, I've seen role equals log used quite a bit. This is great for things like chat messages. And usually, role equals log is used um, politely. It's not usually a message that needs to be announced immediately. It's something that can wait. So I see it a lot used with aria live equals polite. Very similarly is role equals status. And um, I, like, I see that a lot with non-urgent toasts uh, or status updates. Now also very similar to log, I see it paired with aria live equals polite quite a bit. Now, none of those really scream to me what a route announcer represents or what it feels like. Um, but this next role, I think, really fits the bill. Role equals alert. So an alert role communicates that this is an element that's like a flashing error message or maybe a pop-up or something that just needs to be announced right away now that it's super urgent. The user should not move on before they understand what this alert says. So a lot of times we see this paired with ARIA Live equals assertive just because it's so important. Um, I think the route announcer is a good candidate for role equals alert. So I'm gonna add it in just to give our assistive technologies a little bit more context. All right, so we are almost done here. I wanna remind everyone of one of the other issues that we mentioned. Uh, the route was rendered in the top left-hand corner of, of our page. And we would like to hide this. So I'm going to add a style here, uh, display none. Directly into the P tag. So we have uh, style equals display none as an inline style. Let's see what happens here. So I'm gonna click on family. Oh no, <laughs> nothing happened. I navigated to Lottie's family and no alert was given. I also don't see the route being rendered anymore, but that announcement that we were getting earlier completely stopped. Let's try one more time. Yeah, that's not good. Okay, so I want everyone to hypothesize why this might be. And I'm gonna take a drink of tea really quickly. <laughs> so what does display none represent? It means at least from what I gather, what I usually use it for, the user shouldn't know that this element exists, it's hidden. And if it's hidden, the screen reader and other assistive technologies aren't going to want to interact with it either, with it either because it's not 
it's not uh, rendered. It's not shown to the end user. So why should assistive technologies give feedback that it exists? Why should it be interacting with it? Because it's display none. Uh, same, same thing for visibility hidden, opacity zero. Uh, because it's hidden, assistive technologies are not going to interact with it or let the feed, uh, give feedback to the user that, that it exists. Now, we're in a very interesting case here, though. We're in a case where we don't want this text to be rendered. However, we do want assistive technologies to be able to interact with it and let the user know that it exists. So we're going to do something that I uh, do quite often here, and we're going to add the visually, a visually hidden class to this p tag. Now, the goal of this visually hidden class is to hide the text visually, but still allow assistive technologies to be able to interact with the text. Now, if you stare at the CSS long enough, if you haven't seen it before, you might be able to convince yourself, yes, this will hide the text. Um, I just copy and paste it with every project that I work on. I just carry it with me in my, my toolbox and I use it whenever I want a screen reader to be able to uh, interact with something that's hidden. You also might see a similar class. A lot of people use SR-only or screen reader only. Uh, that's what this is all about. So let's replace that display none style with this visually hidden class on our route announcer. So on our route announcer, we have aria live assertive, role equals alert, style display none, and I'm going to remove style display none and add class name equals visually hidden. Okay, and let's see what happens with our route announcer now that we have this visually hidden class. Latte story. I clicked on the story link and Latte's story was announced. Yay, we did it. <laughs> this is awesome. Not only was it announced, but it wasn't rendered on the home page. So um, this is great. Everything worked out fine. And I want to pause here and let's take a look back at everything we did to make this route announcer a reality. So the first thing we did was we added Aria Live. And Aria Live took us really far. It announced the page name whenever the page name changed. Also, we added Aria Live equals polite. But if you remember what that ended up doing, was announcing the route name, but it did it much later in the process. Uh, the screen reader was like, all right, I'm reading everything off right now that um, I'm already, that's already in my queue. And I will just push this message, this new message onto that queue. So we changed that. We said aria live equals assertive. And what that does is tells the screen reader, stop, stop what you're doing. Uh, if page name changes, please, please, please announce the page name. So that's why we have our aria live equals assertive. Role equals alert was to give a little bit more context to assistive technologies that this is yes, a P tag, but it's so much more. It should represent a, an alert. Um, and then finally, our route was rendered on the front end and this was no bueno. So what we wanted to do was remove it. We wanted to not have it rendered, but at the same time, allow for us as technologies to be able to interact with it. And we tried display none first, but display none actually took it away, but took it away for everyone, screen readers, um, and the browser was not rendering it. So we added a class, visually hidden, that had some styles that would hide this element, so this route announcer, from being rendered. But at the same time, it's not, uh, it's not the, the, the screen readers and assistive technologies are still going to be able to interact with it. So I want to pause here, and I want to give some big, big kudos. Um, this route announcer was inspired by the works of two very important people in both the accessibility world and in the Jamstack world, uh, Marcy Sutton and Madely Rose. Marcy Sutton did a lot of user testing with Fable Labs, Fable Tech Labs, and found several issues with a lot of Jamstack sites, and also gave some recommendations. And ARIA Live regions and route announcements was one of the problems that was uh, bubbled up from there. Also, Madeline Rose made a very, very impactful, important PR into the Gatsby core, 
And um, that PR included this route announcer. This route announcer that we just did today was a simplified version of Madeline Rose's uh, work inside of this very, very important PR. So kudos where kudos is due, a uh, huge shout out to these two and everyone else who's been working on accessibility and in, in, in the Jamstack. So I wanna move on to the next optimization that the Jamstack makes, which is equally cool in my opinion, images. So when the Jamstack does its build, it's going to take your images and optimize them. It's going to make different versions of them. So if you have a user on a mobile device, they're gonna get a mobile version of the image. Um, also, as you scroll down your page, these images are gonna be lazy loaded. And you get this lazy loading for free, which is really, really cool. Um, I, think, I think that's really important because when you're loading the page, when a user loads your page, you want your time to first interact with the be as fast as possible, right? So here we have the network panel open. And what I'm going to do is scroll down Latte's photos page. And as photos are about to enter the, the viewport, you're going to see requests for these new images being made. This is the loading, the lazy loading happening in action. Take a look. So I'm scrolling down and more photos are entering the viewport. And as every photo enters the viewport, we get more network calls. And these network calls are these images coming in. Okay, I'm gonna show that one more time. So as we load, we see these images. And take a look at this. Uh, there we see the, the width and the quality. Uh, we see these different URL params here that are given to us too. Now, how do we get these image optimizations to work? Do we get them for free? Well, the one trade-off you have to do is use a higher order component called image. Uh, or it might be capital IMG, depending on your static site generator. Also, it's important to note here that some uh, static site generators might not do this image optimization. Again, it really depends on the SSG you're using. But a lot of them use a certain higher order component that wraps an HTML5 image element. And uh, a good example looks like this. This is one way to um, use our static site generator's image component. So he see here, I'm importing our static site generator's image and using it with the source tag. It takes usually the same props that the image attribute, the image tag does. Uh, so we're gonna put a source here and it will output a lazy loaded optimized image. Now, what accessibility issue does this introduce, Kyle? <laughs> Very good question. It actually doesn't introduce any issue. However, I really, really like this higher order component pattern that we're using here. And I think we can use it to solve a big issue that we see on all websites. And that is what happens when no alt tag is put on an image. Uh, take a look, very much so like this image. <laughs> so here's what happens when a screen reader focuses on an image that doesn't have an alt tag. Slash image, URL equals percent two images percent two flatty dash Christmas dot JPEG ampersand W equals 1200 and Q equals 75. Oh no. Not only does the user not get helpful, descriptive information about what this image represents, it actually provides quite a jarring experience. Um, Assist Technologies announce an image's file name if no alt is produced. And that means that a file name is going to be announced and it's quite jarring and it's very unhelpful, especially nowadays when we have a cache tag that's appended to file names with a whole bunch of random letters uh, we don't want this to be announced if there's no alt tag. Now, a great way to overcome this is by, of course, always, always adding an alt tag. Uh, sometimes, as we mentioned, these sites are created dynamically. If we're pulling from a blog uh, CMS like WordPress, and maybe the content creator didn't add an alt, we should have a backup. So what we suggest doing here is adding an empty string if no alt tag is able to be produced. Um, what an empty string will do is it will actually skip that image. So yes, sadly, the user's not going to get descriptive information about this image, but they're not going to get that jarring experience of the file name being read, which potentially could be many, many characters long. So here's how I propose we, uh, we fix this issue. 
I want to create my own higher order component for my Jamstack website that puts in an alt tag that's an empty string if no alt tag is provided. And here is the code. Um, we're importing that static site generator image, that higher order component that the static site generator gives us, and we're wrapping it um, in our own component. And I want basically to take in the alt tag and set a default for it. So let's just pass this alt tag from our props and pass it into our static site generators image. And of course we want to default it to an empty string. So if one doesn't exist, let's pass it the alt empty string. So now at this point, if no alt tag is given, at the very least, we'll give the alt an empty string and the user uh, won't be read the file name at this point. But yes, there's more attributes that would be passed in. So let's just grab the rest of the attributes and just pass them down to the static site generator image component. I'm gonna call it rest of props. And I'm using the splat to grab the rest of them. And I'm just going to, uh, again, <laughs> splat those props. into our static site image, uh, static site generators image component. So now we have a higher order component wrapping a higher order component that will output an HTML image. <laughs> I know, kind of wild having chained higher order components. So um, now let's observe what happens when we use this element, this image that we just created on Latte's website with photos that don't have an alt tag. So I'm highlighted on family. There's an image under family, Latte's family. And then below it, there's another header called Kyle. And so the goal here is for when we go to the next element, Kyle will be read off and the file name of this image will not be read off. Everyone ready? I'm crossing my fingers. Kyle. Hey. <laughs> it announced Kyle. This is exactly what we wanted. We. Uh, did not want this image file name to be read off. Now, I think it's important to mention too, that this paradigm is also used for images that are designs, uh, images that are used more for design purposes that probably shouldn't be read off by the screen reader. So if you have maybe like an image that's a horizontal bar that divides two paragraphs, for example, uh, you could also add an empty string as the alt tag. It's a good trick that I like to use. Okay. so. I wanna give kudos, by the way, to everyone who joined. Um, thank you so much for being such great pair programming partners with me and navigating through some of these improvements that we can make on all of our Jamstack sites. Again, certain static site generators will give you different optimizations. Some might not give you these accessibility issues, some will, but if you do run into them, it's totally, totally fine. It's nothing that we can't fix. Um, it's only not fine if we don't fix it, right? Now, before we go, I do want to share a quick little story, if that's okay with everyone. Um, tea time. So on RuPaul's Drag Race, every few episodes, the queens, the drag queens, they're asked to like create their own wardrobe based off of a certain theme. So RuPaul will be like, category is summer soiree. And these queens are absolutely amazing. They go and to this thing that they call the workroom. It's just this room with a whole bunch of fabric um, and supplies and they grab as much fabric as they can to that they think will make this look that they're going for. And it's so impressive because they take these fabrics and put them into a sewing machine and make the thing that's in their head a reality. And kudos to them because I don't know how to use a sewing machine. Also, some of these queens sometimes don't know how to use a sewing machine either. Some of them might not have a sewing background. And so you can tell sometimes when they take out the glue gun and start gluing fabrics together and sometimes even gluing the garment on themselves. And you know what I think to myself when I see that? I'm like, that is so brilliant. Good for them. Like they're using their resources the best of their ability. Sometimes the judges say that look is a little crafty and they use that word crafty in the same way that uh, we might say the word hacky. And again, I always think, well, at least it works. And so sometimes in this accessibility world, what I've noticed is that the solutions aren't always going to be elegant. 
we might have problems that we might need to be a little bit crafty for. And you know what? That is okay. We saw that visually hidden class, right? We didn't use this CSS style uh, for it. We had to do a whole bunch of CSS styles. Some might call that crafty. Some might call it hacky. And you know what? That is totally fine. Um, at least your website is more accessible and making this world a more open place for everyone. And that's what matters, not the elegant code, not the elegant solutions. So just keep trying. If you find an accessibility issue uh, and you have a solution, go for it, make that PR, it's totally fine. So that's all everyone. Thank you so much. I will be here for questions. Also, um, if again, if Tinder seems like a place I would like to work, please feel free to send me an email uh, my email is kyle.boss at gotinder.com. Also, I'm always open for questions. My DM is all, my, my inbox is always open. Feel free to send me a DM. Um, my email is always open. Send me an email. Um, and I'm here too for everyone who's here live. So thank you, everyone. Take it away, Brandy. <laughs> That was so awesome, Kyle. Thank you so much for such a good session. Uh, looking at the chat here, it looks like everybody else really enjoyed it. Um, we had some people chatting in and liking, saying that this was so well presented, this was such a great demo, and that they always love a Kyle Boss presentation. So amazing job. Uh, everyone seems to love it, yeah. <laughs> we do have a couple questions. Um, the most upvoted question was wondering if Latte can make an appearance. Yeah, he's right here. <laughs> here he is. Oh my goodness. That's honestly like one of the cutest puppies I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. He's such a sweetheart. I think you made the attendees all super happy. That one was upvoted 10 times. So thank you for bringing Latte in. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another really popular question uh, was asked, what technologies do you recommend for a good Jamstack? What static site generator and whatnot did you use for Latte.dog? So for Latte.dog, I use Next.js. Um, now, in terms of what static site generator I recommend, they're all very different. Um, they're all similar in the fact that they output static sites, but the way that they get there is very unique to each an individual one. Um, and I say they all have their pros and cons. I think um, a lot, of, like all the ones that I mentioned, Next, Nuxt, Gatsby, 11T, and Redwood, uh, those all have amazing docs um, that, so it makes it really easy to adopt. Um, but it really just depends. I know that's, a, that's an answer that's not as satisfying, but it, it just depends on your use case. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Another question just came in that said, thank you for comparing crafty and hacky. What are common mistakes you see people make when make when overusing ARIA labels? Or what are some limits to the crafty solutions? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so I think I've been to a talk here at the conference and I forget who said it for the life of me. I'm so sorry. I'm going to quote someone, but not give them credit. Um, but someone at this conference said that ARIA labels are great, um, but the best way to use ARIA labels is to not, or ARIA attributes is to something along the lines of don't use them. Use the HTML elements that are given to you. For example, of course, we've heard of the example of people using a span with an on click and then giving it a role equals button. Why not just use the button class, right? Or the, sorry, the button HTML element. So that's kind of the limit that I would use. Um, sorry, there was a second part about limits that I, I totally forgot what the last part of the question was. Let me pull it back up real quick. Um, totally. They asked, or what are some limits to the crafty solutions? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, so when whenever I introduce crafty solutions, um, you, you do wanna make sure that you're not adding too much technical debt because technical debt does add up over time. However, when it comes to accessibility, I don't think I've seen a time yet where a crafty solution uh, is going to be turned down um, because at the end of the day, being accessible is really important. I, someone else at this conference said accessibility is a civil right. I totally agree with that. Um, so if you can do anything to make your site more accessible, go ahead and do it. Um, 
I haven't seen a time yet where, where it was too crafty for me to say no. <laughs> awesome. Uh, another question, this one's a little more specific. They asked, when you added the role equals alert to the route announcer component, did that HTML, HTML element then have two roles, alert and nav? Did it have two roles, alert and nav? Um, well, it, it wasn't a nav. It wasn't, it was not a nav component. It was a, um, or sorry, a nav element. It was a, a P element. Um, oh, I, is, can I ask back, like, is the idea, like, is it, is it a nav role and a alert role? I would say no. I would say that it's a single role and that role is alert because we're telling it, hey, this is, this is an alert um, and our, and at accessible uh, AT screen readers will see that role equals alert and be like, okay, this is an alert. Uh, it's not gonna mistake it for a nav. I hope I answered that accurately. If not, feel free to send me a DM and I'll try to clarify. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think we have time for one more. Oh, sure. the, the original asker uh, yeah. Matt said exactly. So I think you answered it correctly. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh um, and then time for one more question. Yeah. Um, this one says, I worry about keeping my HTML semantic when creating small components, since lots of static site generators wrap pieces or pages in divs. Um, mm. Any tips for ensuring your components are semantically written? That is a very good question. Um, it really depends on the static site generator because yeah, like you mentioned, some of them are going to add divs. They're going to wrap your whole uh, site in a div uh, with an ID. Um, and I, I think your best bet would be to, to just download it, try it out, and see if like it introduced any accessibility issues. Um, because it, the answer is going to vary widely depending on what static site generator you're using. Awesome. Well, we are just at time here. Absolutely. Uh, so this will conclude our session for today. Thank you um, so much, Kyle, and for bringing in Latte uh, to join us. And thank you so much for everyone that has attended the session. Um, I hope you yeah, all have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>